Do atmospheric conditions affect radio propagation? Powering radios out in the field? And amorphous versus crystalline solar panels, this time on Mailbag Monday. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Ham Radio Tube. My name is Mike. If you have amateur radio questions for me, shoot me an email, k8mrd at icloud.com. I would love to hear from you. We got three great things to talk about, so let's dive right in. This first viewer asks, hi, Mike. Hi. I'm wondering if you can answer a question for me. Do atmospheric conditions like humidity, uh, I think he means lightning, snow, clouds affect propagation? So... That depends. <laughs> Generally, for HF propagation and for propagation in, in in all forms, it doesn't usually matter what the weather is in terms of propagation. Especially on HF, we rely on that big ball of fire in the sky that we call the sun and how the sun's rays ionize the different layers of the atmosphere. That's the ionization of the different layers of the atmosphere is what allow us to communicate via HF uh, ham radio. By ionizing the atmosphere and, and basically, I, I'm not a scientist, but what the sun does to the atmosphere is it basically splits apart the atoms and like the proton, they lose a proton or something like that. And that's what allows our signals to go up and refract off of the atmosphere and back down. So it has nothing to do with weather at all. I can attest living in, in Michigan most of my life where it's gray and cloudy and gloomy and miserable six months out of the year doesn't affect ham radio one way, shape or form. Now, of course, there are caveats to that. There are things like rain scatter, um, meteor scatter, even though that's not really weather related, but there are guys that in the higher frequencies, like in the gigahertz, can actually use the rain as it's falling to scatter their signals and uh, basically increase propagation to places they otherwise couldn't. There's also uh, tropospheric ducting, where uh, I think it's related to temperature inversion in, in different uh, elevations or heights in the atmosphere where, uh, and again, this is more common, like two meters kind of thing, higher frequencies where because you have these thermal tropospheric ducting where one layer is under the other uh, and the density of that, that can allow like two meter signals, um, for example, to kind of get up into that thermal duct and just travel much further distances. A case in point, when I lived in Cleveland, I was I was living somewhere south of Hopkins Airport. And in my morning commute, it was still dark. I could hear the station that I used to listen to in Detroit, WRIF. Uh, and I was listening to Drew and Mike on my commute to Cleveland. And that station, uh, WRAF, was like 100 miles away from me. So much further than you would normally be able to communicate on, you know, they were 101.1 megahertz. So kind of close to the two meter band because of that tropospheric ducting, I was able to hear it. Same thing with like repeaters. I, when I was living in Michigan, I heard uh, some repeater in Ohio on, I think, the Clarkston repeater because they were on the same frequency and same tone, but they were so far apart, normally you wouldn't be able to hear them, but I'm hearing guys talking. I actually got on the air and I talked. I'm like, how are you talking on this repeater and toner? He's like, I'm in Ohio and it's the same thing. So uh, there are some situations where weather will affect propagation, but generally not. And same thing with like snow. I've had my antennas covered in snow. Ice doesn't affect it one way or another, other than the weight of the snow and the ice making my antenna droop. So uh, lightnings can certainly affect propagation, especially if it hits your antenna, uh, then you're gonna have zero propagation. Um, and you will hear lightning strikes, static crashes on your radio when, when you're listening to them. Um, but they're just usually just quick bursts of uh, uh, static crashes, but uh, not really affecting propagation. So hopefully that answers the question and thanks so much for writing in, I appreciate it. 
Next, we've got a question about one of my absolute, well, a couple of my absolute favorite topics. This viewer writes, I got my ham radio license a couple weeks ago. Congratulations. Round of applause from everyone. Welcome to the hobby. And I bought two radios. All right. So he's sucked in. Both radios are ICOM. Nice. I bought a big one for the house and the other is a 7300. Well, I wonder what, what, what is the big one? Did you get a 7610? Did you get the new, what is it? The 7760, I think the new one that just came out. We, you got to tell us that we're nerds. We want to know. Uh, I would like to use the 7300 for POTA. My question is, how do you power your radio in the field for POTA? Are you using a generator inverter from your car or another power source like solars or battery, etc.? So great question. Welcome to the hobby. And this is a question that a lot of new guys are going to have. Um, so generally, I'm not going to use a generator. Uh, sometimes for like field days, we might have a generator out. Um, that's usually not powering our ham radios, though. We're, we're I think you're going to find most portable ham radio operators are going to use a battery, specifically a lithium iron phosphate battery. So uh, I personally use 99% uh, of the time uh, a battery from Bioeno. So for a for a 7300, this is kind of the first big battery I got. This is a 20 amp hour Bioeno battery. Uh, hours and hours and hours you should be able to get out of your 7300 with this. Uh, what I actually use now though is uh, they're 30 amp hour battery. So same thing, just a little bit bigger because there's just more battery inside of it. But I don't just use the batteries themselves. I, I like to build things. So that 30 amp hour battery we just looked at inside this box is that 30 amp hour battery. I used to have the 20 amp hour battery in here and then I'm like, I want more battery. So I put a bigger battery in here. Inside this box, there's a solar charge controller. So this yellow power pole right here, I can plug in solar panels and that will power the system. I've got USBs here. So I've got two USB-Cs and a USB 3.0. I wish it was just all three USB-C, but what can you do? And then I've got a switch switches here, that light's broken. Um, that are gonna power this bottom power pole here, this switch, and then this switch powers these two power poles. And so I have three outputs. They're, they're all fused. There's a fuse box in here. Um, so every circuit has its own fuse. And that way I can power multiple devices when I'm out. As far as charging, I can either charge with solar or I can charge with just a charger I'm at home. Any one of these red and black power poles, I plug a charger into and it charges it back up. I've got this meter here that's gonna tell me the capacity, uh, my current draw, like everything that I wanna know in terms of voltage and what's going on with the battery. So that's what I do. But I also like this box here. Inside here is a 100 amp hour mini lithium iron phosphate battery. And it's based same principle. I just, it's just a bigger box. I've got the same power poles with, uh, you know, the yellow ones for solar charge controller, which is built in here. On the other side, I have another meter. I prefer this meter way better than the other one. This tells, this tells me, this counts down the amp hours and when it's charging, it counts back up. So it actually gets back to a hundred percent where the other meter just counts all the amp hours, whether they're coming in or out. So you don't actually really know the state of charge of your battery. And then I've got that same USB thing here. So, and there's a, uh, there's a 10 amp Genesun charge controller in this one. There's a 20 amp BioNO charge controller in the other one. So some kind of lithium iron phosphate battery is where you'd want to start. I would recommend uh, at least a 20 amp hour. I think a 20 amp hour is perfect for the 7300. Uh, if you want to get a little bit bigger battery, obviously your operating time will increase, but that's also going to depend on like what mode you're using, how much you're actually transmitting, uh, all kinds of variables. But I, I would start with at least a 20 amp hour battery. Big fan of BioNO. Uh, the owner, Kevin, is a ham. Uh, he's supported the ham radio community forever. He actually has a discount code. If you want to save 10% at BioNO, 
Just type in HRT for Ham Radio Tube, HRT at checkout. It's not an affiliate link. I don't get any commissions for it. I get nothing, absolutely nothing, other than the good feeling that I have been able to work out a deal with Kevin to save my viewers 10% off anything at BioNO. So there you go. Hope that helps. And thanks so much for writing in and welcome to the hobby. I really mean that. Thanks for uh, thanks for writing in. Lastly, we've got another question that kind of pertains to the last one. This viewer says, Hi, Mike. Said hello to you at Hamcation last year. You flipped me off but then gave me a Ham Radio Tube sticker. That sounds like something I would do. So I guess that even things out. <laughs> anyway, do you prefer amorphous or crystalline solar panels and why? I'm building a battery box and this is the last piece of the puzzle. Thanks for your input. So that's a tough question, man. Uh, I have both. I use both and I like both, but I'm kind of in a different situation than most having a YouTube channel and getting products for free. So I just want to put that on the line there. I'm going to make a blanket statement and say the most important answer to this question is going to have to do with the fact that hams are notoriously cheap, myself included. And we'll look at price over just about everything. <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> I, I brought some visual aids here. Here we have a PowerFilm solar panel. PowerFilm is an amorphous silicon panel. Here we have a Bioeno panel. Bioenos are crystalline, specifically monocrystalline. You want to look for monocrystalline. Uh, they're they're more efficient and, and more better. So both of these are comparable in size, wattage, the weight on the crystal crystalline panels is more. So in terms of usability and and the the features and benefits of both, the crystalline panels. One, like we said, are going to be cheaper, exponentially cheaper. But what you have is a more rigid panel, okay? These aren't, these aren't very flexible, okay? But that is a 28-watt crystalline panel. Here is a 25-watt amorphous silicon panel. And these are cool because they just fold up. They're... they're very, very flexible, okay? Very flexible. And these are very, very thin, okay? But all of that is 25 watts, okay? So in terms of like the physical size and the layout, you can see, and Satan's modeling for us, Amorphous silicon is going to be much bigger because they require more panels to do the same thing where the crystalline the, the crystalline panels are more efficient. The the benefits to the amorphous panels are they're generally going to be a bit more efficient in low shade environments or if the panel's shaded. You know, if you put a if you put a uh, you know something if 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 shade is covering a crystalline panel you'll you'll get more loss than with an amorphous panel so it's it's kind of hard for me because i have a i have a youtube kind of business relationship with power film and i really really enjoy their panels i i use them more than i use my bioeno panels and i have a 100 watt panel from them i have a 60 watt panel from them as a consumer as a regular guy power film is out of my price range okay to put it into perspective a 100 watt crystalline panel like this from bioeno is like 209 dollars okay where a 100 watt power film is almost $1,400. So like more expensive than my radio. So personally, I wouldn't be able to afford, it's just out of my price. And PowerFilm knows that. Like ham radio operators are not their, their main uh, source of business. They're just, they're great panels. Uh, another thing with the amorphous, at least, and I can only speak for PowerFilm, they're gonna be a lot more durable. 
And and what I mean by that, Power Film has a great video where they actually take their panels to the shooting range and put all kinds of rounds into it. And they have it hooked up to a meter where you can see how little the voltage actually drops, even having damaged cell, uh, damaged panels. Where with like a crystalline panel, if one of them is damaged, pretty much the whole panel is shot at that point. So I can argue for either of them. I mean, yes, my background is in sales and I'm trained in features and benefits and I sold high end things. But um, I, for the average ham, it's honestly hard to justify the cost if you're just going to a park and throwing out a panel for a few hours or camping over the weekend. Um, it's it's really hard to justify power film just f solely from a price standpoint. Um, but I have used them extensively when we went to my friend Ryan's place out uh, for the solar eclipse. We were camping and I had my power film panels spread out. And it's just gravel road. And his dogs are walking all over him. At field day, when I was spending field day with Jason and, and, and Frank and Digital Rancher, we had uh, my power film panels up. People literally walked right over him on gravel. No problem. Same thing at the Belton Ham Fest a couple months ago. Had my power films out. People are just oblivious. They just walk right over them. No damage, no nothing. I don't know if I would have the same results if someone walked over my crystalline panels. They'd probably be okay, but I feel a lot more comfortable in those situations with the power film. Another thing I could say with the crystalline panels is generally with... <clears throat> like the folding kind, like the 100 watt panel from BioNO and similar brands, they'll have like Velcro legs that will come out so you can actually angle the panels towards the sun, where power film, they're, they're generally just made to be laid on the ground. Uh, they do have grommets where you can hang them from some cord off of whatever you want to hang it off of to kind of angle it towards the sun. But um, the, the, the crystalline panels, in my experience, are easier to angle towards the sun if that matters. Uh, but I've also found that just laying the uh, power film panels flat on the ground has kept my batteries charged uh, over the course of, of many, many different weekends of me being out camping or at uh, field days and things where my batteries are topped off. And I just, you, you, you kind of don't need to worry about kind of angling them towards the sun. They just they're just great harvesters of energy from the sun. So I know I'm kind of dancing around this, but I really like them both. If you're coming just at a cost standpoint, 100% the crystalline panels are gonna work for you. But if if weight is a consideration, the amorphous uh, panels do weigh some significance less than the crystalline panels. There's also the flexibility. If you are gonna be taking these portable as their main purpose in life, maybe spending that extra money for an amorphous uh, uh, amorphous silicon panel like the power film panels uh, could potentially prolong the life of the panel because they're flexible, you know, throwing things in and out of a car and things getting jostled as you're driving. There's less potential for things being damaged with something like uh, the power film panels. So how's that for a really long winded answer from a guy who can't afford power film? <laughs> They're both going to work. One's going to save you money. One is going to cost you a bit more money. I think that's in most ham's eyes, probably the more important thing. So thanks for writing in. I hope that helps more than confuse. Um, but I appreciate your writing in. So uh, that's all we got today, guys. If you have amateur radio questions for me, shoot me an email, k8mrd at iCloud.com. I'd love to hear from you. In the next time, we'll see you again on another episode of Ham Radio Tube. 73, y'all.